So we started off talking about family, and then we got into basically um, granddad and conservatism. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically looking at the word conservatism means that one feels the need to conserve and what it is conserved means either that we feel we have precious little and what we have left, uh, we are life dependent. Or that is uh, becomes more symbolic in the sense that whatever I have, I feel more secure than I would if I were without it. And so... Uh, there are many, many examples of that kind of thing, including the story of the prince and the pauper, where a little pauper boy, they discovered that he was actually the prince. They took him to the palace, they dressed him in royal clothes, they gave him an education, and they had a posted guard around him for his protection. But he was smart enough to recognize he had a better life out on the street, and so he left. <laughs> <laughs> that having having guards around you are only for those who are very conservative. But he didn't feel like that he had gained something by becoming a prince. He felt that he had lost something, his freedom. So conservatism really means that we have to conserve something. And so... Uh, you can see that in the sense of the Southern white uh, mentality that they, uh, the racism has to do with fear, that they're fearing now Christianity is, is that it's becoming the minority, that it's feeling cornered, and that all of the security that Christianity brings about now is not offering that same level of security. That in fact, white supremacist, if you look at the word, you'll see what that actually means is, is that they no longer feel supreme, that they're losing something. And so that's what we mean by conservatism is the need or the fear of loss of something, rather than more younger people will have the idea that I've got to go get it to gain. But once I get it, now I have to conserve it or protect it. And so that's why young, youth and old age happen like that, just because of the amount of physical goods or status or whatever someone gains that they think now that they need to conserve. So that's where you can correlate older people with conservative because they have accumulated something that they want to conserve. But you can extend that to ideas that you have had some ideas for a long time and you want to conserve them too. Precisely so. It's not just material goods. Oh. It is also the way we live in the sense of rights, rules, rituals, supposed to, this is the way it ought to be done, etc., like that. These things actually correlate directly to the form primary instincts that I was taught in biology school. And then I was challenged on that. So we went to the internet to find out that yes, those things still exist in that form. The four primary instincts is number one, the big one is the self preservation instinct, followed by uh, the procreation instinct, followed by the nesting instinct, followed by the territorial instinct. And you can see that in each case, humans still live instinctual lives. They've just, uh, in some cases, taken the real and made it into symbolic. An well, example of that is territory, that though we don't tend to have physical territory in the sense that I'm in Berlin and I can go to Wabash, but more in the sense that I am a German, even if I go to Wabash. Wait, what do you say? Self-preservation, procreation. What are the primary instincts? Self-preservation, procreation, territorial, and what? Nesting instinct. Mm. 
All right, and each one of these things the Buddha had specifically listed as one of the four modes of clinging. So the way we cling is actually instinctual. Isn't that amazing? That how we cling and what we cling to are the things that we are pre-programmed out of our DNA to do. I mean, it, it makes absolute sense, right? You, you develop an instinct, and then now that, as you have mentioned, has become, life has become so easy, and there's no real, like, uh, risk of dying, we still cling on to these because at some point they were useful for survival, right? Precisely. So, these are all survival issues. This is why the dogs are so territorial, is that it's a survival issue. Makes sense. This is why the dogs sleep in a packed and uh, uh, wilderbees and such uh, uh, group into a herd, especially at night. Because the outliers of the herds are the ones the lions are going to eat. And so the deeper into the center of the herd you are, the safer you are. And so that mentality is what people place people into politics, not recognizing that once they're in politics, now they become conservative directly <clears throat> in the sense of, I feel more secure by being in this position. Well, and, and yet they're being constantly attacked by the press, by the other party, et cetera, like that, and they're actually under attack. If they'd go home and sit down and cool it and get out of politics, they would actually be more secure, even though they would not feel more secure. Yeah, I mean, it, this is, I don't know how much you know about the politics in Mexico, but it's essentially what's happening. There was this guy who wasn't trying to become president for like 12 years. And now that he's, and he was the su super liberal and blah, 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 blah. And now that he's in power, mm -hmm. he's the most conservative idiot. But yeah, as soon as he had the power. I could have guessed that. <laughs> yeah, he became, um, yeah, he became just like, everyone else, every other politician. Well, a little bit worse, but yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, the um, one of the stories that I have seen, in fact, this was a wall drawing that I saw several places when I was in Washington, D.C., so it was kind of a click. And that is, it was a line drawing of someone standing in a pool of water surrounded by alligators. Uh -huh. And the caption of it was, is that uh, when you are up to your hips in alligators, it's hard to remember your original intention was to drain the swamp. Mm, okay. All right. Now, why would anyone want to drain the swamp? Because they would feel inherently a little safer if that swamp got drained. But when they get into the swamp to drain the swamp, now it actually gets really dangerous. But if you stay in the swamp long enough, you become, then you become one. Of, you become one of the alligators, exactly. <laughs> and you want to conserve that swamp. And this is very instinctual for human beings. You can see it in the uh, procreation instinct, most specifically. Though most people in the West because of their Catholicism and all of the stuff that went with that, they tend to think of sexuality. But procreation in and of itself actually means to produce or to take control of something physical. An example of that is taking control physically of a, uh, the cartoon is in fact the guy in a bearskin uh, is walking towards his cave and in his right hand he has a great big club and in the left hand he has a handful of hair dragging a woman into the cave. And she's unconscious, okay? 
you would think immediately this is sexuality. Oh, no, it is using that club for power. And it's the club that's the important point. Not that he hit a girl with it. It's that he went after a club so that he could do that. Now, we have all kinds of signs of that in, in uh, the animal life. There are birds who steal shiny objects. There are uh, nest building. All kinds of stuff like that that is not actually the nesting instinct is the procreation instinct in the sense of gathering things together. But the thing that the, that the humans have that is quite different from the apes, the apes use tools. Many times they'll have tools. One of them is to take a, a slender reed and run it down a hole so that the grub will start grubbing on it. And then they quickly pull it out and the grub will not let go of the reed. And so now they've got a morsel, but they don't keep the reed. They dispose of that reed. We're humans. What we did was we used a rock to break up a bone to get the marrow out of it, but we kept the rock. We polished the rock. Mm -hmm. Monkeys don't have pockets. Humans have pockets. Okay, so we started to collect things. And so uh, fast forward a million years, and that club in our hand became a, a, a knife, and then a spear, and then a cell phone. So we're better at optimizing tools. Right, so we're upgrading our tools because we feel safer, and in fact, we are actually physical safer walking around with cell phones rather than spears or guns. Well, arguably. Arguably, right, I know what you're talking about, but in general, and that's the whole point, is let's go ahead and argue about it, because people don't feel safe, while in fact they are safer, in the sense that the guy next to me may not stab me, there's stuff on that cell phone that people get stabbed with nonetheless, yes. or they feel stabbed by it. Yeah, especially I mean, if they've got a newscast. <laughs> yeah, well, or or people are so distracted on their phones that they fall down the stairs or into a fountain or get run over <laughs> by a car or something. So it, it's robbing them from their attention. Precisely, but uh, the whole point of it is is that they want to feel more secure. But that's what conservatism uh, is all about, to where, uh, let us say, an opposite of uh, conservatism would be altruism. And you can see elements of altruism in the Democratic Party that you don't see in conservative Christianity, though Jesus was an altruist completely. Well, so you would and say yet that Christianity is conservative completely. So, but basically, but, but by those standards, any establish anything, it's conservative. Even Buddhism is conservative, right? Ta -da! <laughs> You're making my point. <laughs> perpetuates anything. So, so conservatives, conservatism by itself is not inherently wrong, as long as what you're trying to conserve is promoting some some good well let's look at this way if you're trying to conserve something whether you consider it good or bad that conserving ultimately at the bottom of it has to do with greed okay so in other the words, you, want, you want something now what is below that greed Below the greed is this sense of safety and security versus being afraid. That that's in fact the bottom line is the self-preservation instinct's job is to preserve not the self but the organism. It was wrongly said when it was called self-preservation. What we mean is the individual organism's preservation instinct. And that in human beings, that thing is just, uh, let us say, overworked. 
Now, at one time, it fulfilled its function. In fact, it was necessary for that thing to be online most of the time. But in modern society, we don't need that self-preservation instinct in operation because we're not, in fact, in danger. Especially not if we're wise. It's only when we don't know, when we're curious about the danger or the, in the sense of doubt, then that's going to keep that self-preservation instinct alive. Let's not call it alert, because it's not actually watching what's going on. It's just getting ready to watch what's going on. <laughs> this is very interesting that this self-preservation instinct then guides this grasping and clinging to whether it's one of these three things and we grasp and cling to. And that is material possessions, articles. The next one would be the ways that we do things in the sense of the way that we were taught in our society that gives rise to the, the Buddha used the word sila bhatta paramasa, which are, is our uh, rights, rules, rituals, shoulds, woulds, coulds, uh, the ways to do things, etc., like that, all, almost all the way down to the language that we speak. Now, Freud referred to this as the superego, that this is where all of that stuff is stored. And that's what we would call or equate with the nesting instinct in the sense of that if you're going to get into that herd, you've got to go according to the herd's rules. Or if you're going to stay in the nest with this group of monkeys, then you're going to have to behave yourself according to nesting rules. And if not, they'll throw you out and it might be dangerous out of the nest. These are all very instinctual behaviors that unless we become wise to them, we'll begin to control our lives. But when we do become wise to them and catch them when we're in doing that, then we can come out of it. You do not have to live instinctually. You can live mindfully instead. And so the last one then is the territorial instinct. Hang on just a second. We'll cover it in, in, um, and go back into all of them in depth. And that is the territorial instinct doesn't actually have to do with physical territory so much anymore as um, mental territories. And what we mean by that is our identification with outside organizations. I'm a Catholic. I'm a Protestant. I'm Jewish. I'm a Buddhist any of those kind of identifications, but also political parties. I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican, or on national levels. I'm an American, I'm a Thai, and that uh, wisdom shows that those boundaries not only should break down, but they actually do break down when you see those boundaries. But if until we see those boundaries, then we will continue to identify. And that we want these boundaries to break down because holding those boundaries is suffering. An example of that would be the Republicans. People who identify as Republican, when the Republican Party has a good day, they go up. And when the Republican Party has a bad day, they go down. The tighter they are um, attached to the GOP as my party, then the more they suffer when it goes down. And yep. so being a Republican right now is a whole lot of suffering because there's a whole lot of bad days for the Republican Party. But it, and no, and, and, and you can get even sillier, like what if your team is the Patriots and the Patriots lost or the Patriots won, then that's a good day. That was the next that. item on my list was the gaming. Who is attached to a particular sport team? Yeah. So, so it can be religion, politics, sports. It uh, can be um, items like uh, Fords are better than Chevrolets or European cars are better than Japanese cars. So, so these are primary instincts that were necessary at some point for survival, but then now they're not. And, but these are things that make you miserable. The cling. Precisely. Because so we cling to them. So do you think that they're like sequential? Do you think that you deal with the territorial first and then you work your way up to self-preservation or? 
or or can you work with them individually? The answer to that is one by one as they occur. As you catch it when it's coming up, mm, okay. recognize it and do away with it right then. Well, and you will see that some of them are more persistent than others. Well, because it seems like the self-preservation deals with the idea of the self, which doesn't exist scientifically or otherwise. Um, and so once you catch, once you get rid of that one, it seems like if there's no self to preserve, then there's no nesting because there's no other selves, there's no procreation, and there's much less territory. So it's actually, it's actually tackled first or more strongly than the other ones. But that's just me thinking about this. Um, how, to, how to attack this problem. Ah, well... That's where Anapanasati comes in, except that it's not an attack upon a problem. That's, that's actually just ordinary view again. But it's rather to, to see that it is a piece of crap that we're clinging to in this moment, and I'm unhappy about that piece of crap I'm clinging to. Let me let it go. Let me get rid of that thought and think of something that's more wholesome. And so if I watch when the, the Democrats are screaming, yay, 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 or the Republicans are screaming, yay, 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 the first thought to have is they are screaming, yay, 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 but I am not them. I am not a Republican. I am not a Democrat. I do not identify with one or the other. Therefore, I can be free of all of the um, trauma that each one of them has as they go up and down. Well, but, but there are reasons to, to cheer, right? Not necessarily if you identify with them, but if you believe that whatever the cheer was for was inherently diminishing suffering in humanity, which you should feel happy about, right? None, so yes, except except that you're counting on herd mentality to stop doing herd mentality kinds of stuff. That the real issue then, the better way of talking about it, that this is something that each individual person needs to come to understand through a teacher. This is why that lineage of the Theravada, and it's also there in all of the other Buddhist systems, and in fact, it's, it should be in Catholicism also, except that uh, it's not wisdom that, that gets ossified into whatever becomes of that teacher's lineage, unless they're careful, is going to be ossified into the organization, and then the people will cling to the organization as if the organization is going to um, get, release them from suffering rather than what the teacher is teaching. So we understand that there are is fought with problems, but that the general nature of humanity is to still continue instinctually. So even though they will have a higher ideal, we are organizing and building this organization to do good, it winds up not always being good. Let me give you an example of that would be the, um, the Red Cross. Mm -hmm. You can go for another one, and that is the, uh, uh, the Daughters of the American Revolution. But let's go for the Red Cross because that one still exists because they didn't go down the tubes in the same disastrous ways that the Daughters of the American Revolution went down the tubes. But it's actually a better story. So back to the Red Cross, less than 20% of all the donations that goes to the Red Cross actually goes to the reason that the Red Cross exists. The other 80% goes for the maintaining of the organization called the Red Cross, including salaries and 
equipment that they buy and business deals they cut and all kinds of stuff like that. Well, so what does the bain the twenty percent leftover goes for? For actual um, relief? Effort? Yes. Right, but look how much political strings are attached to what relief is given when, where, and how. It's become a political organization. And then, in fact, many of the donors also will donate to organizations like that in order to get them to do what they want done rather than what the organization thinks needs to be done. So this is just one example, 80%. Now, you'd think of an organization that was designed to do good who would, would try to turn that around so that the organization's existence was only 20% and the rest of the money went for the actual charity benefit. Well, I guess moral of the story is that people love politics and whenever something gets big enough, it has to become political. Otherwise, Precisely. Just don't like it, or people won't support it. Precisely. Because I remember this um, is this is why the whole point about the teaching of the Buddha is, is to give the world away. Recognize that the whole world is causing you suffering. That it's not so much that the world is a bad place; it's that I am attached to that bad place. And when I see that I'm attached to that thing, I recognize not only am I disgusted with the world, I'm disgusted with the fact that I'm still attached to it. So, would you say that you're fully detached from, the, from these particular things? How hard it is to become detached from the world? How <clears throat> one, one thought at a time. All you have to do is remember to detach uh, yourself from it again. So do you think, okay, so do you think that ideally you just want to be selectively detached? You want, you want to have the skill to be detached whenever something is unpleasant, but then maintain attachment whenever something is pleasant? Um, that makes the detachment when it's unpleasant more difficult. But but as you mentioned before, difficult is for losers, right? Or are you a winner? Or right. You a winner? That's what. That's the whole point. You okay. just made my point for me. Okay, I don't understand now. So. All right, all right. Let's put it this way: a whole lot of what really right, noble view is about is to stop looking at good and bad or what is worthwhile and what is not worthwhile, but recognize, no, the difference is, is can I be um, sharp enough to see what's happening in this moment rather than claiming something is good and keeping my attachment to it when in fact I haven't done a thorough investigation of whatever it is that's good that I'm attaching to. So that that's still just a belief. So that in fact it's really a really, really excellent introduction into the story of Adam and Eve. Uh huh. So the idea is to be purely an observer without adding any judgment to the, to the, to the things being observed. Precisely. That's the only way to deal with paradise. Just look at it. Don't. Yeah, just enjoy the hell out of what you have, because otherwise you'll destroy the place with your choosing and picking and choosing of what you like and what you don't like. So, off to the Adam and Eve story, because almost all Christianity gets wrapped up in the story itself without looking at the actual moral of the story. So the story itself is about talking snakes and who bit the apple first and who seduced who and who wears a fig leaf and was it an apple and all of that kind of stuff, which is not the real story at all. The real story is eating of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. 
Now, what does eating of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil mean? The eating of the fruit means you have to bear the results. That's the eating of the fruit, the fruit of the tree, the fruit of the vine, the fruit of one's labors. It's not a physical fruit like an apple. That's just, you know, children's thinking of a literal story. Instead, the fruit is the result. This is in, in, in Buddhism, they call it Kama, Kama Vipaka. Or uh, you have um, result. If you do a good action, you'll get a good result. And if you do a bad action, you'll get a bad result. So the knowledge of the fruit means that you have to bear the results of your knowledge of good and evil, which means you go around and say, that's good, that's evil, this is good, this is bad, this I don't know, this is good, this is bad. And by doing so, we destroy paradise. We literally kick ourselves out of paradise. We don't kick ourselves out. We destroy paradise. An example is here I live in a perfect paradise, but this tree, hmm, it's got some brown leaves and another and all. Oh, there's a bug eating that leaf up there. Let's go cut that tree down because I don't want any bug eating leaves in my paradise. So. If you can come to a state of not judging good and evil, but just enjoy the show. I think I think enjoying you typically associated with good though. Right? Well well at least I would say that enjoying something it would be weird to enjoy something bad. Well, what what show do you know of that doesn't have a villain that's villainous all throughout and finally gets conquered at the end? Isn't that the story every time? To conquer bad through good? Well, that's what it appears. It depends upon which side you take. For an example, let's put a... Um, let's put a story about American invasion of Iraq. And on one side of the theater, we put a whole crowd of Americans, and on the other side of the theater, we have a whole group of Iraqis. Uh -huh. Now, are they all going to be cheering at the same time throughout that movie? Or are they going to be cheering according to their attachments of what they think is good and bad? Another example, back to the, uh, to the uh, field of play of a football game, and the flag goes up, penalty flag, and half the stand jumps up and cheers in rage. Ah, that was a wrong move. And the other half of the stand jumps up and says, yay, our team, go, go, go. Okay, so was that flag that was thrown, was that a good flag or a bad flag? Was that a good call or a bad call? The answer is it's subject to opinion. And when we gain right view, ultimate right view, we look at the problem is not as whether the opinion is good or the opinion is bad, but look at the opinionizing itself so that we stop holding opinions and we continue to investigate. Observe is not, is too passive. This is not, this is not an observation. This is an investigation right down to the fingerprints. <laughs> so you're perpetually investigating, well, you are investigating it now. Right, exactly. That. <laughs> Good catch. Uh, <laughs> you're learning already. <laughs> now. And I guess it's, 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 it's a curiosity, as you were mentioning before, right? So you, so you have this curiosity that doesn't make it too good or bad. You just you just being curious about your surroundings by investigating it. Okay. And so just enjoy the show. Investigate the heck out of it. Watch what's going on. 
get a real load of it. It's like a spy mystery novel. The whole point of a spy mystery novel is can you figure out who done it from all the clues that were sprinkled throughout the book before you get to the last page? But don't you think that that promotes a very passive um like yes okay whatever yes the answer is yes a resounding yes and that word passive is actually quite uh interesting word to look at huh. it is it is actually a word in the poly and it has two qualities to it one of the qualities is to sit still and let something on the outside, a train or a vehicle or something, pass on by. Let it pass you by. The other one, which is more direct, is, is that you sit and do nothing, so you're passive. But basically what you're passive to is that which passed by. Now that word is translated in uh, from the Pali into English as tranquility. Other languages have the word calm, at peace, not ruffled, but become passive. Yes, that's the whole point. You do not have to be an actor on the stage. You can go sit down in the audience and enjoy the show. You know, uh, Shakespeare says, all the world's a stage. And each one is an actor upon the stage. And so everybody's out there playing a part. They're preening. What they are is they're creating an identification of themselves or they're playing a self. And many people throughout their lives are role playing so much so that they can't tell the difference between who they really are and what that role is that they're playing. Not recognizing, of course, that, that, that who they really are is not that role, but it's also not clearly definable as some other role. So it doesn't. So basically, it doesn't matter what you're investigating as long as you're investigating it, right? So your objective experience can be complete trash. You can be in, like, in a in solitary confinement in a cell for the rest of your life, but then if you are in tranquility, just investigating your environment then you can enjoy it yeah and you're not attached to it so if you make judgments of this is good and this is bad and so by judging something when something happens you judge it as good or bad and now you're going to feel accordingly but when you are just an observer when you stop eating of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil because you're not going around knowledge and choosing what's good and what's evil, then you don't have to bear the fruit of the what attachment. About, what about like actual sensations? What about like pain? Can ah, you pain. What is pain but not liking a sensation? Yeah, but I think that those are much more deeply, more th those are more than instincts, right? You have, you have. Ex exactly, all right. So um, Willie and I were just discussing that. In fact, Willie has just um, uh, tried to enter the call and I didn't stop. Do you mind if I add him to the call? Because this is getting right into his and my territory now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. Let me add Willie. All right, let's see if he does. Yes, he and I were just discussing dentist office. Okay. Where the dentist office is one of when <laughs> you smile, so you know what we're talking about here. That's one of the places where people kind of think that uh, uh, they associate the word pain with the word dentist. That's very common worldwide. It's even true here in Thailand. I would say, yeah, I guess I would say it's also very mundane um, view of pain, but yeah, for sure. Well, 
easy to um, easy, very just, easy to relate to. Just for uh, that's why I chose it, yeah. <laughs> as opposed to what you would consider then ultimately super mundane pain is a little more difficult to deal with. So let's start looking at what we can deal with. And what we can deal with is talking about dentist. Here's something very interesting. The last time that I was at the dentist office, she said, what I'm about to do is going to be very painful. Then she said, I suppose you don't want any um, shot or I don't what, remember what word she used, um, Novocaine or whatever. But if you do want it, raise your hand. Now, you will never hear a dentist say that in the United States. Mm -hmm. They will naturally just go ahead and say, this is going to be very painful. I'm going to give you a shot. Or they may not even say anything at all. They'll just pray the thing and get ready for the needle, put the needle in. And everybody just assumes they know what's happening is par for the course. Mm -hmm. But here in Thailand, the dentist actually asked. Now, why she did, I'm not sure. But the natural answer was, now that I've give, been given a clear choice, I'll choose to not raise my hand. In fact, I'm going to be working on keeping the hands really relaxed. And so then the thoughts when uh, the intense sensation is there is, is that this, this is the body. And the tooth belongs to the dentist right now temporarily. She can do with it what she wants to do. And I'm going to stay, lay here, whatever there is left of me, as relaxed and comfortable doing deep breathing. I think, in fact, it was the reason that I was doing deep breathing is when she was saying uh, that, you know, that never mind about the Novocaine. Because deep breathing is a sign that one is in good state of homeostasis. When people are fearful, they'll stop breathing. They'll hold their breath. But if you're naturally deep breathing, then the dentist, especially a dentist in Thailand, <laughs> knowing all about Anapanasati and whatnot, she will just naturally assume. Now, um, the actual sensation did come in waves. And it looked like that she was not going to stop <laughs> for a while. But the whole, then the thought came, well, Perhaps I'm just an alien from outer space, and I'm coming to deeply investigate what it's like to be a human in a dentist chair. That, in fact, I do not want to be with Novocaine because that's going to prevent me from actually seeing what's actually happening. So do you think... Um... And so it has a whole lot to do with the fact that it's not disliking or hating or wanting to withdraw the pain, but rather to greet it, to look at it, to investigate it. I think it may also have to do something with, in because one of the first things that you said was an intense sensation. And I can only associate intense sensations with pain, right? Because I don't, I don't, I but mean. Pain is the word that's an attitude. You don't have to make that association. You can just keep it at the level of intense right. sensation that can be experienced right. as part of the show. But I think I think that humans tend to associate any intense sensation as a painful. Precisely, one. they certainly do. That's natural. It's instinctual, and it is suffering. It's like it's like food. People, most people. At the beginning, don't like intense flavors like spicy or like a uh, really aged cheese or a really, um, yeah, mm -hmm. because they have intense flavor and people just instinctually find it painful or find it wrong. Which Repulsive, right, exactly, which is I don't like it. Intensely, I don't like it. 
So that's why those things are like an acquired taste. So maybe, yeah, maybe pain is just the same. Maybe it's just an acquired taste. All right, can... well, look at the kinds of people who go beyond that. Mud wrestlers, athletes, they go beyond pain. Marathon runners, they get a high off of there. They don't, they don't succumb to the pain. They don't become victimized to it. They become a champion of that pain. But they still call it pain. Kawanka would recommend to call it just a sensation. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. So, what you're saying is, is that we decide we're eating of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. We're calling that intense sensation pain, and by doing so, we're saying it's bad, and because of that, we are now not in this present moment in paradise where someone else can say, oh, I can handle this. The dentists don't kill people. They just drill. So, okay. So and so I can handle this. I'm good. My paradise is intact, even though the dentist is drilling right this very second. I think, I think there's also an important thing about the paradise. Like, I feel like once you go step beyond and start labeling it you get distracted from what you're seeing and then you internalize it so and you're trying you're avoiding it you're trying to push it away you want the dentist to stop you get this you don't like it right you want to escape from it because that happened to me like at the vacation like you're watching it you're watching your beautiful i was on the beach and you're looking at everything and then once you want to see oh, this is beautiful, or this is... Once you start to, like, try to perpetuate or try to remember this, then you're not enjoying it anymore because you're trying to... You're getting other mental processes involved. That, uh -huh, trying to crap, trap... The, uh, what do they call it? Uh, capture the moment. Yes. So Well, so capturing, capturing moment, something is not the same as being free from it. Capturing is, it seems like a bad idea to capture the moment now that I think about it. Because <laughs> then if you capture it. It's going to be old later. Yes. And you're going to, well, you may remember <laughs> it happily at some level, but also you're not living the moment whenever you're remembering that, right? Right. Not only that, but probably the next thought will be something similar. The mind is like that. Uh, Freud calls it free association. And within a minute or two, you'll start thinking about what happened on that trip where you were there capturing the moment and how bad the service was at the hotel or something like that. And now we're not in cap we're not living in that captured moment anymore. We're in the state of suffering. I don't like what happened. So. I've been thinking about this also l lately, and it's it's the idea of memory. So basically, if you're if you're if I am right now experiencing this, then a I'm not remembering anything, but also I'm not I'm I'm not really creating any memories, and I'm not remembering previous memories. So is there? Like, is there any value in remembering anything at this point? Is there any value in our memories if we are only, if our only, like, job is to investigate our surroundings now? Okay, well, you have already answered that question. In the sense that if you're sitting here enjoying the show, then you care not about the previous act. You're caring about this present act as you're watching this part of the show. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So it doesn't, so memory isn't good then? Memory. Well, let us say when you're into memory, recognize that you're in it and come back to the present moment because it's safer in this present moment because you're not in danger now. 
So we stop making judgments even about his memory good or his memory bad. No, it's just that memory is a bit dangerous and it's not real for one thing, but this present moment is real. What is, wait, what is real then? What is real is what you can experience in this present moment and that gets really, really complicated. Willie just rang and I didn't get what his message was. <laughs> um, um, so anyway, never mind. We'll just forget about it. Uh, it was a long message. So uh, I assumed that if he said just call, then that would happen. But a long message means that he is later. So let's go on with this whole point. Uh -huh. The Buddha talked about it that way in the sense of what happened yesterday is dead, it's forgotten, it cannot be changed. And that there's many things that you used to have that you don't have anymore, and if you think about those things, then you'll say things, something like, oh, I had it and now I've lost it. But if we don't spend time in the past, if we just spend our day enjoying the present moment, then there's really nothing to do but to sit and enjoy. But if I start thinking about the past, I might think about, oh, I, that motorcycle in the basement needs to be brought out and, and, and repaired. I got to go do that. And so now I got to go do motorcycle maintenance when I could just be sitting here on my porch, all because I thought about it, plus this um, mental map that I carry around that I should repair motorcycles, which is part of the super ego, is part of my rule base, that motorcycles have to perform well. I guess it's kind of the same um, mental mentality that uh, small plane operators, single engine planes, Boy, those engines are extraordinarily uh, important. You do not want that uh, uh, engine to sputter and stop while you're in flight, or he, he wouldn't. And so that old mentality for me is that you got to keep the motorcycle in good repair. Well, I mean, but I, now I recognize that. And so now I can just leave that motorcycle in the basement <laughs> until somebody sells it. Well, I mean, it doesn't it doesn't even go as far as the motorcycle. You don't have to do anything. What about eating? What about eat? What, OK, how do you? Well, then about? you're hungry. OK, so down to the physical level, because all four of the instincts have some things there to be done with. OK, but at the physical level. We, uh, we can find the bottom line, and the bottom line is that which below we fall, then we're for sure going to be suffering. And so over time, an individual will actually be able to, uh, to lower his bottom line to where in most of society, once you come up to a certain status, you want to maintain that, and if you go up, so it's always an uphill battle, and that's where conservatism comes from. But within this, uh, the Buddha Sangha, we want to find out what our bottom line is and then start to lower it. Now, what is the bottom line? The bottom line is just enough housing, just enough clothing, just enough food, and just enough medicine. Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa actually added a fifth one intentionally, uh, and that was just enough what he would call education. which is part of that observing. Or you could call it just enough entertainment, if you understand the word entertainment correctly. Whoa, 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 whoa. I don't know. I don't understand entertainment. Well, you can be entertained by the here now. Yeah, but... You can be entertained by something that's educational. Listening to the Dhamma like you are with me right now is both entertaining and educational. So, and one would say that it's actually vital because without it, you would suffer. Okay, so 
So you have to minimize these needs, both emotional and physical, so that you can barely... As far as the physical requirements, there'd be four. So the education would be a fifth one, but that's not a, that's not a physical item. That would go into one of the other instincts. Okay. But this would all fit into the realm of the instincts, especially the procreation instinct. How many physical objects do you have to have in order to be happy? How many cell phones? Another way of asking that question is, and by the way, for me, that would be how many laptops? The answer is one at a time, but over the course of 20 years, there's been 20 or more laptops. <laughs> You should get better laptops if you're getting rid of one per year. I have mine for like at least five years. Um, well, no, you're making a, a, a different kind of judgment. Let us say uh, of the laptops that are, are here at the house, there's probably about 10, but most of them actually still function. Why do you have 10 laptops? Over time. Are you? <laughs> Interesting. Um, I think it's getting late um, here. So um, we can start wrapping up. Oh, you should understand that you're talking to a computer scientist. Oh, interesting. Mm. Interesting. That'll that'll help you understand. Just that one little word right there is, and I'll explain to you what what that is about. It's actually called the Busman's Holiday. It's one of Eric Burns' only good games. The Busman Holiday. Yeah, where does a busman go on his holiday? I don't know. He rides the bus. That's what he's been doing his whole life, but now he can actually make friends with the old ladies that he knew getting on his bus. He can also take a close look at the route. He never got to look around. He always had to be driving the bus. Now he can actually enjoy the ride. Okay. So like right. being a server at a restaurant and then eating at the restaurant. Right, okay, so right, the favorite place for the guy who just sold the restaurant to eat is his restaurant he just sold. Got it. Hmm. That's, that's, nat that's natural behavior. And, in, uh, so, and what it means is that what you have be become accustomed to throughout your life, you will live that way in retirement to a degree. And so naturally, I need a laptop for Unix and for Windows. Mm, okay, makes sense. And also, I have several servers. Oh, shit. And so there's more than one operational, but this one, and in fact, some of them are just sitting on the shelf, powered down. Here, in fact, is a notebook, a next book that I bought with my daughter, and it's fully charged right now, but it's got a problem with the BIOS, and I don't know how to get it fixed. And she didn't like it anyway, and so I don't see any reason to get it fixed. The laptop itself is perfectly good, but the operating system uh, is a kind of a closed shop, and I don't want to open it, mm. nor do I know how to turn the BIOS on. And so I can do without it. But it's just an example yeah. of what, what we were talking about. Cool. All right. Well, I think I'm going to start getting going. All right. Well, we didn't ever get around to talking about JC. Well, so um, call I'm, again soon, and we will discuss him in all his altruism teachings. Awesome. Yeah, I'm. I am. Uh, yeah, I'm back from vacation, so I'll. I'll be able to talk um, way more often. Great. I'm really glad. Yes, I think a lot of people are like that, that they become actually uh, imprisoned by 
the holidays. In some way, it's a we 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 change our prison in the holidays. <laughs> well, it works both ways. Many people turn their holidays into prisons. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, and these are the same people who live in prison, right? So you just change the prison, and you just you just get a new one. It's a refreshing prison, um, one with sandy that, beaches and people in swimsuits. That reminds me, Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa has a book on prison. Uh, the, the prison of life. He calls life itself a prison, as well as a whole, list, a whole list of other things that are prisons. So the prison of life by Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa is available on the internet. And we'll see you later. Okay, sounds good. Bye. <laughs>